uh, webcast. Oops, I do apologize. I m failed to uh, address the, the title on this slide. Uh, but today's title is uh, How Transit Agencies Implement Best Practice Strategies in Complementary ADA Paratransit Eligibility. Um, today's presenters are uh, Molly Ranahan. Uh, Molly is a postdoctoral fellow in the Primary Care Research Institute and research assistant a professor in, for the Departments of Family and uh, uh, Medicine and Urban and Regional Planning at the University of Buffalo. Her research and professional interests include aging, patient activation, community engagement, and health education. Uh, Dr. Ranahan collaborates with colleagues from the Center of Inclusive Design and Environmental Access on research focused on universal design and the built environment. Our second presenter is Jordana Maisel. Uh, she is the Director of Research Activities at the Center for Inclusive Design and Environmental uh, Access, which is located in the School of Architectural and Planning at the University of Buffalo. She also serves as the co-director of the Rehabilitation Engineering Research Center on Accessible Public Transportation and a project lead in the current R, uh, in that current center um, on universal design and the built environment. Um, with that being said, I'm going to hand the presentation over to uh, Molly and Jordana. Uh, take it away. I thank you, Stephanie. You're I welcome. just want to make sure. Um, I want to thank the Cutter team and Stephanie for inviting Molly and I to speak uh, this afternoon. Uh, we're really excited to share our research with everyone. So this is Jordana. We're doing a little switcheroo. I'm starting, and then Molly will take it halfway through. Um, hey, Jord hey, Jordana, you just have a slight echo. Do you have your computer speakers uh, muted? I do have my computer speakers muted. Um, is it better if yeah, I hold up the microphone? Yeah, that's okay. Better. I will Thank hold you. the microphone. No problem. Okay, so we're just going to get started so we can use this time. Um, as Stephanie said, uh, Molly and I did this work as part of um, the IDEA Center, the Center for Inclusive Design and Environmental Access. And just as a little background, the center has been around for over 35 years. And our mission is really to produce knowledge and tools to increase equity in design for underrepresented groups. So we're a multidisciplinary team of architects, engineers, planners, um, occupational therapists, all working together on really diverse projects related to research, both, both basic and applied, product development, usability testing, um, a lot of actual accessibility and universal design implementation, and then training and education. But today, we're specifically focusing on some of our transportation research. And while the IDEA Center has been engaged in the built environment realm for a really long time, um, we started exploring the connection between inclusive design and transportation uh, almost 10 years or so ago. And it's not difficult to see the close connection between um, inclusive design and transportation because full participation in society um, really hinges on having a usable transportation system for all, particularly people with disabilities who are often um, at a greater disadvantage in the trans transportation realm. Uh, and so economic independence and self-sufficiency are possible only when transportation is accessible, affordable, and available, and that it's close to home and goes to places where people actually need it to go. And so just a little background on all the different transportation uh, research going on at the IDEA Center. Um, so as Stephanie said in the introduction, we've had something called an RERC, a Rehabilitation Engineering Research Center on Accessible Public Transportation since 2008. And that is a five-year grant cycle funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research, also known as NIDLR. And when we first started that grant, um, we really focused on the fixed route bus, the large bus, um, the design of the vehicle, and we had some paratransit research in that. Um, and so that's what we're really focusing on today, some of the outputs of that research. 
But just to give you a little greater context, we also have a field study right now that's looking at independent wheelchair securement on uh, the large bus. We also have a study going on related to ride hailing, um, working with Toyota Social Mobility. And then as we're looking towards the future of transportation, we really, we're trying to apply what we know about the fixed route bus and paratransit and actually see how that can be incorporated into the design and implementation of autonomous vehicles and shared autonomous vehicles. So it gives you a, a little context of all the different studies going on. But again, we're focusing on some of the outputs of our last round of research related to paratransit. So as a little introduction, um, some of this we probably all know and why we're here today, but millions of Americans experience transportation barriers. These barriers are exponentially worse for people with disabilities who have more frequent need for health care, require greater accessibility to transportation, and have lower incomes than the general population. Approximately 2 million people with disabilities cannot leave their home because of transportation difficulties. Those individuals that are able to leave their home represent 40% of the 15 million people in the U.S. who have inadequate access to transportation. Limited fixed route bus service areas, physical barriers, and poor information access often prevent large sections of society from using our bus and or rail systems. Paratransit services provide a vital link to community activities by providing transportation to doctor's appointments, religious activities, and employment for many individuals with inadequate access to transportation. Paratransit provides a demand responsive option. In contrast with fixed route, paratransit trips often provide curb-to-curb -curb service that picks up riders at their home and drops them off at their destination or vice versa. And while paratransit really enhances mobility for many, um, there are some limitations to it, including the need to do advanced scheduling, the frequent delays, the cancellation penalties. But despite all of this, paratransit demand increased substantially between 2007 and 2010. During that time, the 10 largest transit agencies experienced a 22% increase in registered paratransit riders and a 31% increase in the overall number of paratransit trips. And when you dig a little further, these agencies report various reasons for this growth, including reduced availability of other transportation services, the growing population of older adults, inaccessible transit stops and pedestrian infrastructure, inexperienced traveling by public transportation for many of these people, and challenges among transit agencies implementing effective ADA paratransit eligibility determination processes. And we'll get back to that in a second. But agencies continue to face increasing pressure to contain paratransit costs while maintaining service quality. It's this balance that they need to find between the physical and economic demands of providing ADA complementary paratransit services and accessible fixed route transit services. But all stakeholders really benefit from shifting paratransit ridership to the fixed route options whenever possible. For paratransit riders, it leads to increased flexibility and personal independence. And for transit agencies, the advantages include cost containment. But really, limited research explores the implementation of best practice strategies for trying to encourage the able paratransit rider to use fixed route. And so that was the starting point um, for Molly and I when we really um, under started this research project. And so when we did an initial lit review, we found two critical pieces uh, or two critical reports that really guided this research. The first was from the Government Accountability Office in 2012. And the, just as a little background, the Federal Transit Administration requires agencies to self-certify compliance with ADA paratransit service requirements in order to receive funding. But since, the NF, but since the FTA selects only a few agencies for a full review each year, identifying the specific actions agencies take to address changes in cost and ridership remains really difficult to do. And so to investigate these issues, uh, the US GAO, the Government Accountability Office, conducted a national study using the FTA's ADA compliance reports 
in addition to a generalizable web-based survey of 145 transit agencies and interviews with federal officials as well as 20 transit agencies. And from their findings, they, um, they learned that to offset rising paratransit trips and costs, transit agencies pursue a couple of different strategies, including more accurate eligibility determinations, they align paratransit service with ADA requirements, they offer travel training, they collaborate with health and human service professionals and other transportation providers, they improve the accessibility of fixed route service, and they implement new technology for scheduling and dispatch. So that's where we started. And then a second study by Thatcher et al. in 2013, um, they described the areas of operation where public transportation agencies have implemented changes and improvements to encourage greater fixed route transit use by people with disabilities. And their findings um, identify things such as bus stops, increasing marketing and public information and travel training, fare incentives, transit service, and ADA paratransit eligibility criteria. And so their findings really reinforced other research that had been done that illustrated the importance of agency eligibility determination practices and addressing operational challenges. So this theme started to emerge for us about these best practices and eligibility determination. And Thatcher et al.'s research really went a bit further um, in, in this realm of eligibility determination. They used an extensive literature review and a national survey of transit agencies to identify eligibility determination best practice strategies for complementary ADA paratransit providers. And so their six best practices included things like using in-person interviews and functional assessments, establishing and enforcing measurable and specific eligibility conditions, such as weather conditions, developing efforts to improve passenger awareness about conditions of eligibility and other transportation options, using detailed on-street assessments to detect path of travel barriers, offering travel training on fixed route for conditional eligibility passengers, and adopting trip-by-trip -trip eligibility and software to enforce um, the conditional eligibility criteria. And while this really highlighted a lot of um, new information and key findings, there was, this research is really limited to only a few case studies of agencies that adopted these best practice, practice strategies. And so you didn't get a really full picture about how these different transit agencies went about implementing these best practices um, and what worked, what were their challenges, and what were their successes. So, that led to our approach in really trying to go back to some of those transit agencies to investigate um, how they actually implemented the eligibility best practices as Thatcher and all defined. And so, uh, so the research goals were threefold, to determine the extent to which transit agencies are adopting the best practices, um, describe how agencies are implementing these strategies in daily operations, and exploring the factors that contribute to implementation successes and challenges. And so we targeted, our sample targeted that initial group of 20 transit operators that were described and reported on in that GAO 2012 study. Um, they were based on their geographic diversity, um, the size of the paratransit system, and their reputation. So all 20 were contacted for potential participation in our study. Um, we ended up doing semi-structured telephone interviews with uh, 16 of the 20 who responded to us. Um, and we developed uh, an interview process, um, interview questions, using a really detailed, iterative, multi-step process. And then after the interviews, we did some qualitative analysis doing thematic coding um, of the raw data using a multi-step process. And I'm happy to provide more details about their methodology if anyone would like later on. And so to report on our findings, I am now going to turn it over to Molly, who's going to walk us through 
um, what we learned from those interviews. Thanks so much, Jordana. So um, to move forward, first we want to tell you a little bit about the transit agencies that we spoke with. So as Jordana said, um, we contacted all 20 agencies from the initial GAO study, and 16 um, agreed to participate. And the table on the slide gives a breakdown of the agencies who participated, their FTA region, and um, their physical location throughout the United States. So one of the first things that we learned in doing the interviews was that um, each agency that we interviewed utilized at least one of the six best practice strategies identified in that study by Thatcher et al. during el their eligibility determination process. And in fact, over one half of the agencies implemented at least four of the eligibility determination strategies. Four implemented all six practices, and two agencies used only one or two strategies to date because of some different implementation challenges, which we will get into later in the presentation, related to things like cost, limited resources, personnel, and facility capacity. Um, and I think the biggest takeaway for us was that most tra transit agencies incorporated multiple strategies as part of a larger department-wide changes that they were making within their agency. So in-person interviews and functional assessments were the most popular strategy that were used across the 16 agencies that we interviewed. Um, all but one agency were doing this to improve their eligibility determination accuracy and also to increase um, customer education and communication. So 12 out of 15 agencies used functional assessments, but only 13 agencies were really able to consistently use them with all applicants. Um, the agencies who felt that they were doing this the most successfully hired dedicated personnel to conduct the functional assessments or collaborated with um, local universities to improve the accuracy of their functional assessment determinations. 13 out of 15 agencies adopted in-person interviews, and a majority of these 13, um, nine of those agencies, conducted them with all of their applicants. And just kind of sharing um, a little bit more context about that, the agencies who were doing this described a number of challenges when initiating these changes to their eligibility practices. They said it was difficult to ensure the accuracy and consistency of de those determinations. Um, it was difficult addressing their, the high volume of applicants, particularly for those who weren't able to do those with all applicants, and they also experienced difficulty confronting customer appeals. Agencies not using this method of assessment talked about several barriers related to cost, um, those increasing applications, and generally just a lack of resources within their agency to do this. 11 out of 16 agencies um, at the time of the interviews were using measurable and specific conditions such as environmental barriers or functional assessments to grant conditional eligibility. Um, as Jordana talked about earlier in the presentation, weather-related conditions were the most common um, type of conditional eligibility that was granted to riders. However, about half of these agencies were not able to apply the identified conditions to their scheduling conditions on a trip-by-trip -trip basis. We had one agency share that they weren't able to enforce conditions unless looking and enforcing by trip. We currently don't have the ability to enforce trip-by-trip -trip scheduling. And this was mainly due to software limitations at that time. Some agencies also experienced political and operational challenges that prevented them from adopting conditional eligibility. One agency shared, we'd love to do conditional eligibility, but we just can't given our current environment. We're a very customer-driven county. Customers are very vocal, and the county rescinded changes within nine days in response to customer complaints when they tried to adopt conditional eligibility. 
One thing that was very interesting to us was to learn about the role of on-street assessments that were done as part of granting eligibility. So about 12 agencies that we interviewed were doing detailed on-street assessments as part of their eligibility process. Agencies used various methods to assess and track built environment data. Um, some agencies used field assessments with in-house checklists or environmental audits. Some agencies used Google Earth or GIS to really track the barriers that were identified as part of their assessments. And some agencies actually incorporated travel training assessments so that when they were bringing their riders out, they would really identify those full environment barriers as part of their travel training program. Well, another thing that was interesting was that really only a few had a process in place to share information about the built environment barriers that they were collecting with municipal offices that were able to actually make those public infrastructure improvements. And that was one thing that we kind of heard over and over is they really had all of this important information about the built environment, but they didn't quite have um, a standard process in place to share that with their county public works office or people that were really able to make those changes. So 12 agencies reported using outreach efforts to improve passenger awareness about not only conditions of eligibility, but other resources available um, for accessible transportation. One agency incorporated customer education directly into their eligibility determination process. They shared with us, we, we do this as part of our interviews, we discuss travel training and other transportation options to help the applicant coordinate multiple services. We actually see this as an integral part of the assessment process and we want people to use Twix routes. We give them options right at the time of the interview. The applicant can have individual challenges, but our transportation coordinator is able to help them with this because it's really easier to do this in person. So we did receive mixed feedback about, um, you know, passenger outreach and awareness. Um, some agencies felt this was expensive. Others felt that the information that they were providing to their customers wasn't being read. And a few felt that it really sent the wrong message. They were concerned that um, really promoting fixed route options for those passengers where it was appropriate might feel like it's pushing them um, off onto fixed route from paratransit. So really, it was interesting to see the pros and cons of this strategy and all of the strategies within the different contexts of the communities that these transit agencies were serving. So more than half of the agencies that we interviewed offered travel training. Um, one agency really reframed the way that they were marketing their travel training program. They shared with us that we stressed the opportunities that fixed route service provides to our customers to ride independently. They don't need to make reservations and they give them, give yourselves a pay raise for free. We put marketing posters in the train stations and bus stops and put ads on the paper. So there were a number of agencies that were really thinking about innovative approaches to travel, tra to travel training. They were providing incentives of fixed route transportation. Um, they were providing unlimited one-on-one -on -one travel training for customers who were interested in doing that. And some were even tracking customer success after completion. So they would um, follow one of their customers after completing the program to see how often they were taking fixed route versus paratransit after the program was completed. So that's a breakdown of the six strategies and what those looked like within those 16 agencies that we interviewed. There's a couple of big takeaways from our study. Um, as Jordana said, ours was really the first to look at the implementation of these best practice strategies across the country. Um, the previous studies that we looked at were really integral in identifying what those were. And our study looked at, well, what did those look like in the different communities, um, different types of communities across the country? One of the big themes that we saw from our interviews is that across all of these six strategies, agencies are really focusing on 
customers' ability rather than limitations, and we saw this as the way that they were doing their outreach and their marketing and how they were reframing travel training. Um, customer benefits of fixed route in public transportation was also really per, was also um, promoted through public outreach campaigns, travel training programs, and the potential to develop collaborations with other departments and community organizations. Another thing that we learned was that agencies who were adopting one strategy um, and not two or three in combination may pose implementation challenges. So for instance, um, those doing conditional eligibility that might not have a travel training program um, may have had difficulty being able to support those riders on fixed routes when um, they weren't, when their trip was not eligible for paratransit. Um, I guess another big take home that we heard from all of the agency was is having supporting technology to support these um, best practice strategies was key. So um, the importance of software for scheduling, particularly um, for scheduling for conditional rides, we heard over and over and really needing scheduling software to really make this feasible. And then um, also the importance of having a community database where they could share those built environment barriers that they identified with um, other municipal departments in their community. So those are some of the big takeaways. I'm going to turn it back over to Jordana just in case she has any um, other things that she wants to share about our funder um, or about the project. I don't think I want to, hold on, forget the echo. Um, the slide up just tells you a little bit more about who funded this project and who funds a lot of our different um, transportation related efforts. Um, but in terms of this specific uh, research, I think I'll leave it there and look forward to questions um, from all of you. Perfect. Um, thank you so much, um, Jordana. I did want to, you had a couple additional slides. Um, Jordana's um, email uh, contact information is there. Again, the, these couple, uh, and then Molly's, sli uh, Molly's contact information is on this slide. Um, this information is also included um, in the uh, PDF in the file section. So simply click on the uh, handout file, click download file, um, and that will save it directly um, to your computer. Um, we do have um, a number of uh, questions that have already um, come in, so we'll take uh, an opportunity. We'll spend the next few moments um, taking some questions. Uh, one of the questions says, um, "Did any of the providers utilize advisory uh, committees to obtain input on the design of their eligibility determination plans?" Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Oh, I'm gonna go ahead, Molly. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, we're not in the same place, so we can't coordinate this quite well. But um, I'll just start, and Molly, you correct me if I'm wrong. I, we did not capture that formally. I can say anecdotally, there definitely were um, advisory committees engaged in many of the transit agencies. Um, they all played a different role. Uh, some were far more active than others. But um, we didn't link the presence of um, an advisory board to any of these findings specifically. Um, are agencies granting lifetime eligibility based uh, based of, uh, upon a disability that would continue to decrease uh, over the client's uh, mobility, such as Parkinson's? This is Molly. I can take that question. Um, yes, yeah, that was something that did come up. While it wasn't something that we specifically focused on because we were really asking about conditional eligibility, it seemed like from the interviews that we conducted that people um, were more likely to, to give long-term lifetime eligibility um, when they were able to do that in-person interview and identify that with one of their riders. Okay, um, the next question comes in. It says, of the agencies tracking customers that are providing, the, the tracking customers after providing travel training, uh, what did they find? Are they uh, more or less use of the, of the fixed route system? I'll start with that one, Jordana. 
I think it's a real mixed bag. I think this is the thing that was most surprising. One of the most surprising findings to us is that travel training yields such different impacts from transit agency or municipality to municipality. In some instances, um, if you some instances it was one on one travel training, sometimes it was group travel training. But it really varied in terms of the success rates from agency to agency and we could not figure out there wasn't any real reason for why in some cases it was so successful and in others it wasn't. So um, very few transit agencies really have the resources to do a formal evaluation um, afterwards. Um, they just don't have the capacity to do that kind of research. And But anecdotally, when you talk to them, um, sometimes they thought it was a waste of money, and then sometimes they actually saw uh, a real impact on increasing fixed route ridership. So I don't have any definitive <laughs> Um, results on that, only that it was quite varied. Okay. Uh, what are other strategies transit agencies uh, are using slash implementing to address uh, mobility gaps? Do you want me to, do you want me to start, Mel? I'll start. Yeah, that would be, um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, aside from paratransit, really things are shifting and I alluded to it at the beginning um, in terms of some of the other research projects we have going on. We're really trying to explore how transit agencies are trying to solve that gap in mobility services and really um, that balance that I described at the very beginning between you know providing this door-to-door -door service and the on-demand um, service with the fixed route is becoming really burdensome. So a lot of transit agencies are looking to um, more innovative partnerships and models, um, things like partnering with microtransit or ride hailing programs to really offset um, some of the paratransit burden. And what we really we know is that um, a large percentage of paratransit riders are really don't even require um, a fully accessible vehicle. And so it's about how can we pull some of those people onto other modes um, that is more responsive to their specific needs. So uh, different partnerships, different models, um, partnering with taxi companies and other wheelchair accessible vehicle providers and volunteer services. So there's a lot of flexible on-demand um, delivery services being um, rolled out. And a lot are in pilot phases. And so actually a next part of our research uh, plan is really studying some of those different models to learn about what's working, what's not working. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that in terms of what the next steps are uh, as a follow-up to this research, um, how you're uh, going about it, or any additional information that you could provide? Yeah. Well, specifically to the paratransit realm, um, after we completed this research, I think uh, Molly and I looked at each other and thought, well, the next logical step is really trying to understand from the rider side um, what are their biggest barriers to fixed route usage. If we understood it from their perspective, um, maybe we could address the issue um, both from the transit agency side but also the rider side. Mm -hmm. And so we actually have a manuscript underway to really uh, learn about those things. Um, and. Uh, and we, we learned a lot, um, specifically the importance of, again, going back to that built environment element um, is really critical, and scheduling of the actual vehicles. Those two things really were the main takeaways as a sneak preview. Um, <laughs> and, um, and then, again, moving into the autonomous vehicle realm and these different flexible models, we're trying to understand what would or wouldn't um, encourage people with disabilities to use these different services. So if they were to roll out, really understanding their needs to ensure that they're being addressed um, prior to the rollout of these new services. Perfect. Um, how does this uh, project relate to transportation research, other transportation research uh, your uh, center is doing? Sure, Donna, I'm gonna let you talk about that just because you are more yeah, involved I'm happy. in the bigger project. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to do that. And so that's 
first graphic um, at the beginning where I kind of highlighted all the different projects. Um, we have a lot of different studies going on um, related to the fixed route vehicle. Um, the past five to seven years have really focused on understanding the physical design of um, the low floor bus and really how do we what what are how do we get people to board and disembark safely? What are their needs? What should the ramp slopes be? The wheelchair securement on the vehicle. Um, there are new models being rolled out, and how do we? How are they being received? Um, what are the usability issues involved with those? Um, and everything from the interior configuration of the bus. So we have a whole arm of what we've done related to the fixed route bus um, with the paratransit realm. I, we discussed it here, but everything is really integrated. So I mentioned that we're really we're also studying ride hailing issues and the challenges that older adults and people with disabilities experience with ride hailing. We um, in the winter had focus groups here at our center with 30 um, individuals with various disabilities and older adults to understand their needs and challenges and trying to feed that forward um, to larger. Uh, companies and transportation network companies to try to address some of their needs. Mm -hmm. And so I think between the fixed route, paratransit, ride hailing, and moving forward to the autonomous vehicle realm, we're really trying to take a cross-mode look at the issues at, um, confronting older adults and people with disabilities. Um, and how um, these research efforts with uh, collaboration, um, what are the benefits of the collaborations with, you know, working with the uh, rail ride hailing, the um, paratransit, and the fixed route? I'll take this one again, Molly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think what makes a lot of our research studies quite interesting and quite successful is that we have industry partners from the onset, or we work with our local. Tr we have a great relationship with our local transit agency who allows us um, to really test things out, use their vehicles, have access to their drivers, their riders. Um, we have a field study that just finished where we had newer models of um, wheelchair securement systems installed on some of our fixed route buses and had our participants actually out riding around and giving us feedback on them. So really having strong relationships with our transit agency, with the manufacturers who are making the securement systems, um, with the ride hailing companies, uh, just ensures that the research findings get into practice um, much more quickly. And for example, some of the research we learned from our fixed route bus research um, actually led to changes in the US Access Board's uh, recommendations on ramp slope also went into design changes that the NFTA, our local transit agency, required when they purchased their next round of vehicles. So based on the findings from that research, so collaborations are critically important um, because there's no use in doing this research just so it's out there in the world for people to just read or, you know, fix a wobbly chair and print it and have it be underneath your chair and sit there forever. Um, we really want to see our findings make it into practice. So collaborations are critical. Wonderful. And then we did have one more question that came in. It says, the majority of the agencies conducted um, in-person assessments. Uh, did you find uh, what the percentage of denials were or the potential, uh, or did potential candidates remove their applications once they found out that an in-person -per interview was required? That's a really, this is Molly, I can take that question. That's a really good question. Um, one of the things that we started to when we started doing our interviews was trying to really track what that percentage of denial rates were. And that was something that got to be a little bit difficult because we realized that each agency really kind of um, tracked the results of this differently. And that was really because of challenges with software, um, so we weren't able to collect that data point across all of the agencies. In terms of people um, withdrawing their application from an in-person interview, 
I don't think um, that was something that came up, but it's certainly um, one of the things that we heard that would become a little bit difficult for both agencies and riders was just the time that it would take. So especially for smaller agencies who maybe only had one person who was able to conduct the interviews or the functional assessments that um, the eligibility process would become much longer. And so that was, it, that did create some challenges for on both ends of the spectrum. And then one, uh, one final question here is, uh, was the success of travel training more uh, successful where bus stops were well lit and or covered with other amenities? Did study look at that at all? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I don't think we, you know what, I don't think that we asked specifically about how the conditions of the built environment um, played into the success of travel train, though I would imagine that um, if people, if communities had better amenities, the training would go over better. I think one of the things that really did stuck out about the success of travel training programs were places that were using innovative approaches, um, like marketing their travel training to different groups of people, bringing it physically to a senior center or a community center, and really thinking about how they could make the program exciting and um, beneficial to those customers. And I think it was really about that outreach and marketing that, at least at the time that we did our interviews, really um, bolstered the success of those efforts. Okay, and then another question just happened to pop in. It says, uh, do you have information uh, on as uh, to how agencies transition to in-person assessments? Yeah, I mean, thinking about it, it really, um, again, each one was different. So in terms of how they would kind of take that on, it typically was something that as an agency that they were wanting to do, they would start by doing that at a smaller scale, so not really implementing that across all of their riders, but trying that out. And I think that was also something that I remember with the advisory board, the places that were able to kind of successfully get their community on board with this process would really engage their advisory board um, from the beginning to help them really think about what this process should look like, what the messaging should be, and who should really be part of that decision-making process. And this is Jordana. I just want to add the other thing I recall from the interviews is that the successful initiatives were mindful that they didn't have to do everything perfectly from the start that they recognize that it's an iterative process, that you do what you can at the time, um, and then you introduce other practices or other best practices when you can. And so they recognize, you know, maybe they would do the functional assessments themselves, and then they would outsource it, and then they would do a third step. So it didn't all have to be done right from the start as it was finalized. Um, so it's another thing to keep in mind if you plan to make a transition. The whole transition doesn't have to happen in one fell swoop. Mm -hmm. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any additional questions. So again, I would like to thank Jordana and Molly um, so much for the great um, presentation and taking the time to answer all of the questions um, that have come in. Um, I, I did open earlier, but I will click it again. If you haven't had an opportunity to fill out um, the evaluation, I have opened that. Um, if, you, if, if, if it does not open for some reason on your end, um, simply click on the evaluation link in the link section and then hit Browse to, and that will open up the evaluation. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, um, we do have our next uh, webcast is scheduled for August 20th. That is a Tuesday at noon. It's our normal time, but on and off off day and on an off week from our normal schedule. Um, we are lucky enough to have Florida State Senator um, Jeff Brandis um, come to speak about transportation that will transform Florida. Um, he will be highlighting uh, current Florida legislation regarding autonomous and shared use vehicles. Um, he will also explain the need for third party validators in this field. Additionally, he'll share some um, in exciting uh, information about projects currently uh, operating and as, as what the future holds for the industry in the great state of Florida. Again, um, thank you so much, and we will see you on August 20th.